talking about this, the idea of uh, bacterial breakdown, we start thinking of the right organism to sort of do this. And we went with the smallest uh, bacterial organism we could think of. There's, there's actually two smaller ones than the one we'll be presenting. Um, but this one is, is, is a good one for a lot of reasons. Uh, ultimately, when you, when you take a genome, like the one we're, we're going to talk about, and, and you um, pull it down to its smallest number of features, to the, this 182 features in this um, genome, it's, so, it's small enough that it can actually be approached as a bit of an engineering problem, instead of sort of wet, wet science, where does this work with this, and a lot of really hard to figure out connections. When you have less than 200 features, it's, it's small enough that you could potentially look at every single one. And that's kind of what we're hoping to do today, is to actually break down this organism the same way that you could actually break down an iPod and look at every one of the features and see that this component and this component work together and that this is what makes this component work. So the question that got a lot of people started with working with this particular organism is a general question of what are the fewest number of genes necessary for a cell to function and reproduce? That's, that's what we'll, we'll define as um, an active cell that can function and reproduce. That, that's what it needs to be able to do. Um, and the reason for this question, I'll skip ahead a little bit, is this research article. So this was done by Gibson and Venter. Um, and it's pretty crucial work. Um, this, when this gets going well enough, this is going to change some things in, 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 how, um, uh, in how biotech works. And the reason is, is the more genes that you have, the more enzymes you have, the more loaded your genome is, the more extraneous factors you have. So if you want to take your genome to the smallest number of features that are necessary, and so when they were doing this, um, when, when Gibson, Inventor, and um, H.O. Smith, predominantly those are the three, three mainstays of this project, were doing this, it was, it was to transform uh, a mycoplasmic bacterium, which is about five times larger than the one we're going to do, we're going to talk about here. And so the idea is, what are the, what's the smallest number of genes that you can actually get in a bacterium, and, and, and it'd be useful. So this just gets at, at sort of what I'm talking about here. Fewer genes, fewer extraneous factors um, in terms of transformation. And the idea that we can tailor make metabolism. Is that, is that all of them? Should I try something else? No, that's all of them. Yes. I read a book about it, and they, they said they start some genes that you need to reproduce are not there. And they do a talk about the future of old and health, like maybe uh, uh, so, so, so the the organeller ones we'll touch on at the very end are in a group called Rickettsia, um, which are a proteobacteria just like just like these guys. Um, but this one is is not organ organeller, um, and and nor are the the ones that they use. So the mycoplasma and uh, carcinella. Um, are not, but rickettsia, which is also a very, very small genome, uh, is, 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 is sister to the genome that led to our mitochondria. And so understanding, understanding rickettsia means sort of understanding. But because these are bacteria, these don't things happen in my mitochondria. Like, the genes in the genome that we're looking at today are all the genes in the person. So just to, because of the one-on-one -on -one stuff. Is better. So the, the lack of mitochondria is pretty interesting in, bac in bacteria. So bacteria, um, the way that they metabolize sugar, they can produce about eight ATP. Consider ATP as um, a, your energy amount. ATP is your, your sort of gas tank that's working. And they can produce eight ATP uh, per molecule of sugar. Uh, you and I, and, and yeast, and plants, and any organism with mitochondria can produce 32. So we're, um, 
we can produce uh, four times as much energy per molecule of sugar in general. Um, because of that, we can maintain a large genome and we can do really interesting and really odd things um, like move around and uh, build physical structures. Bacteria have a much tougher time doing that. However, bacteria are fantastic chemists. And so with this small amount of energy that they have to reproduce and get along day to day, um, they're able to take in a lot of chemicals, mix them up, and put them out there. So in terms of how we determine what is the minimal gene set, um, because that, that's kind of the research questions going in and in, in, into all this work in getting these smallest conceivable genomes. Um, so there's the minimal current genome, um, which is uh, a genome called Tremblea. It's the smallest one that we know of, but we'll probably find a smaller one. Um, the, the more you work on it, the more you're likely to sort of hit that. Another is through comparative analysis. We look at what, what are the genes that everyone has. And the third is experimentally. We can knock out genes. So I just want to add a couple comments. This first question is, I guess, to encourage people who are like totally 101, is this, are you understanding what it means by gene and questions like that? Good. And secondly, if you know a lot more than, than either of us, then, you know, or something, please comment. Uh, absolutely. It. Yeah. Does everybody understand what a gene is here? Good, okay, so this is, there's a handshake, we might want to just okay. Is there a link to the slides? I'll oh. put them up on the oh. other thing. Tonight. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Actually, we, we can do that during, we'll, we'll take a break at some point. And I'll put these up, yeah. You have to the water, when you say gene, you generally just in the protein coding gene, as opposed to the RNA coding. So, that's interesting, because we actually have I mean, we have, we have both of these, and um, so when I'm talking about uh, 182, that's 182 protein coding genes. There are also 28 tRNAs yeah. and um, a couple rRNA. So um, do you guys, uh, would you guys like a, uh, an explanation of the difference between RNA and protein? Great. So, um, protein coding genes are uh, the way that they function is you have your genome. Imagine a big circle in bacteria. In fact, imagine it looks exactly like this. At some point, you have some DNA rib ribosomes that are DNA polymerases, sorry, that move along this genome and start throwing out RNA. So DNA is really stable, and that's definitely its biggest benefit, is it's, it um, won't fold in on itself very easily because it has a double helix. RNA is single-stranded and can fold into a shape on its own um, with, with that much work. And so what happens is um, there are these, uh, these polymerases that start walking along this genome. As they walk along it, they kick out mRNA. And those mRNA uh, eventually turn into proteins. And proteins are the building blocks of what these guys do. Proteins, enzymes, transporters are what get a cell to actually um, do work and build the structure of, of cells as well. So the structure of, of the machinery is built out of proteins. Um, you also have RNA, um, two main kinds in these guys, which are, one is uh, tRNA, and tRNA hold on to amino acids, and uh, they go into a thing, uh, to the ribosome and help build the proteins. So I'll have a slide just a couple before, give me a second. This is what's called the central dogma. So this is the fundamental idea in molecular biology is that you have DNA which is capable of replicating itself into more DNA. You have DNA being transcribed into RNA. So transcription 
It's just a way of writing it in a different language. Then you have translation, which is a way that RNA moves into proteins, and proteins are what actually works in the cell. So this is sort of the fundamental idea here of uh, what's happening in molecular biology. So, was that a decent explanation? Um, yes. On the previous slide on the bacteria, it said minimal introns and uh, non coding strands. I thought uh, bacteria didn't have introns and exons. So bacteria have what are called a group one intron, which is um, similar to introns and eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. um, it's non coding, uh, and it it's in certain organisms. Uh, so yeah, they do have some. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's that's a little confusing. They don't have introns in the way that you would imagine coding sequence in the eukaryote. Mm -hmm. So in multicellular organisms have a lot of non-coding parts, things that don't form genes in their DNA. Bacteria have very few. And in fact, this guy we're going to talk about has even fewer. It's packed. It's completely loaded with everything it needs. And it's not really junk, right? Like like we thought about the humans, it's not the case even here. They really have a regular, regulatory ro role here. Well, so, so that's a reasonable question. Um, so we have hypothetical genes that are fewer than um, 50 amino acids, mm -hmm. which is a very small amount, and it's okay. almost too small to be functional. Mm -hmm. And so we have these things that look like genes but they don't look like any genes that we know of, and they're very small. And so it's hard to imagine what the function of those are. Mm -hmm. um, but in large part, they don't have the huge range of non-functioning parts that are even present in other bacteria. Even when we consider E. coli, which is pretty lean um, in, in terms of genes, still has a lot more things that don't work or that we don't know what they do than this guy does. I mean, I think it's kind of a trope. Almost a lot of people who sort of start learning about genomes say like, I don't believe there's such thing as junk DNA, meaning everything's got to use. But I, I, don't, I don't think that a lot of working scientists uh, feel differently. I, I think a lot of the DNA has some purpose. Yeah. Even if it's just a length of spacer or something like that. But I don't know, I mean, I don't think that that's, uh, that's it's unusual that there'd be like dead DNA could be like historic function. Or so yeah, that yeah. that's and this one has has a gene that I believe is a historic function because its primary partner has been lost. And so um, every every gene, gene every bacterial genome has a, a particular kind of uh, tRNA, which is called a tmRNA, um, which is an error correcting gene. Um, or it's an error correcting RNA that actually has an open reading frame inside of it. An open reading frame is just um, what builds genes. So it's, it's the part that, ha that can actually form into a gene. And so this guy is lost in the genome we're looking at, and it only interacts with one other gene, and that gene is present. And so for historical reasons, it might still be there because somehow evolution has to clear out this gene. And so uh, unless there's a benefit for it clearing it out, it's just going to stick around as long as it needs to be around. And that's, that's pretty much my view on junk DNA anyway. Is, yeah. yeah. In terms of, so, so there's a fixed percentage of, of junk DNA characteristically in, in, um, in prokaryotes, and then there's a, percent, a fixed percentage in of junk DNA in eukaryotes, and is that is that an evolutionary measure of time from uh, an evolutionary measure of of time from uh, of evolutionary time of evolutionary time? Yeah. Is there a numerical me a meaning meaning? Well, in terms of so increasing numbers. The typical way. Yeah, yes, and and no. Um, there's not really a clock for loss and gain of genes. Has anyone looked for it, though? Um, 
So it's it's historical functions. functions. <laughs> so well, it's it's question. Question. Yeah. So the the way that you look for it is typically not the loss or gain of a gene. It's the changing of the nucleotides within it. So the mutation rate of um, a particular base pair going from one letter to another letter does have a clock associated with it. And so when you lose function, you kind of open that um, gene up to just getting random mutations. And so you can use that to time it. So, that, so you can quantify it. So that, that, that's how you would quantify that exactly, of uh, uh, sort of loss of function and um, a gene becoming non-functional because it's um, become basically junk DNA after it's lost its function. Thank you.